Brent Dykes is the author of Effective Data Storytelling, How to Drive Change with Data, Narrative, and Visuals. Brent has more than 15 years experience in uh, analytics at Omniture, Adobe, and Domo. His passion for data strategy and data storytelling comes from consulting with many industry leaders, including Nike, Microsoft, Sony, and Comcast. He is a regular Forbes contributor and has written more than 35 articles on different data-related topics. In 2016, Brent received the Most Influential Industry Contributor Award from the Digital Analytics Association. He is a popular speaker at conferences such as Strata, Web Summit, Shop.org, AdTech, PubCon, Rise, Crunch, and Adobe Summit. Brent will be discussing effective data storytelling, how to turn insights into action. The primary purpose of analytics is to help organizations discover meaningful insights that will inform better decision making. Unfortunately, too many insights fail to translate into action. In the very last mile of the analytics process, insights aren't squandered when they aren't, communi uh, aren't communicated effectively. To avoid this recurring problem, data storytelling can help make your insights more engaging, persuasive, persuasive and memorable. In this session, Brent will share valuable frameworks and practical tips from his new book, Effective Data Storytelling, How to Drive Change with Data, Narrative, and Visuals, published by Wiley. He'll give you a deeper understanding of the art and science behind data storytelling, which is an essential skill that everyone must learn and master in today's economy. Please, well, please welcome Brent to the stage. All right, thanks, Eric. Great to be here and to talk about effective data storytelling. So I think the best way to, to really dive into this topic is to share a story. And this actually goes back in my career when I was an MBA student and I was working at a, at a e-commerce uh, um, retailer and I was one of multiple MBA students that were all vying for a, an internship at this uh, company. And we, we had a, a, a final presentation that we would deliver, but before that we had a midpoint presentation and we would deliver it to the SVP of e-commerce. And he wasn't your typical SVP in the sense that he was a former special forces helicopter pilot. And so he had a pretty uh, domineering uh, personality and was fairly intimidating to a lot of the MBA students. And we we're all nervous about presenting to him because uh, he was a tough audience. And so anyways, I was preparing my midpoint presentation on my project. And during that process, I had actually stumbled across an insight um, that showed our customers didn't really, I think it was related to our shipping policy, but basically they didn't really care about a certain uh, facet of that. And, it, and this, this insight that I had gotten actually wasn't directly related to my project, but I was wondering, you know, this, if this is true, this could really change the way that we approach our shipping policy and, and could have a, a big uh, effect on the department. So I decided to include it. And so fast forward two or three weeks later, I'm in a boardroom surrounded by different managers and then I've got the SVP in the middle. And as I get to the slide that has this, this insight, he looks at it a moment and then blurts out bullshit. And at that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, what have I just done? I've just, I, you know, I've stepped on this, this landmine. I'm doomed. Luckily, I had a, um, a mentor that jumped in and kind of gave me some cover fire. And I got through that presentation. But I did get an insight from this. That insight in that day died in that boardroom. It went nowhere. It, it did not turn into action at all. And I learned a valuable lesson that I need to communicate my insights effectively. And that's when I discovered the power of data storytelling that, you know, if I had really intended to share this insight with the, this executive, I should have invested more time to tell its story. And I failed to do that. So I want to help you avoid this issue and be a better data storyteller. So we're going to talk about why data storytelling. Uh, then we're going to get into the what of data storytelling. And then we're going to talk about the how. And I'm going to spend most of my time on the how, but let's start with the why. Well, back in about 10 years ago, Hal Varian, who's the chief economist at Google, was interviewed by McKinsey. And there's this great quote that he shared, the ability to take data, to be able to understand it, process it, extract value from it, to visualize it and communicate it, that's going to be a hugely important skill in the next decades. Well, a decade later, and we're seeing already that his, you know, he's very prophetic and how he shared this because I believe that this is an important skill, this data storytelling skill. So it really is comprised of two things. It's the ability to find insights, right? Explore the data and find uh, valuable insights. 
And then the second part of that is to explain the insights, right? So to visualize and communicate it. And so this is going to be a huge skill. We're already seeing it today, and it's only going to get uh, more and more important that we know how to tell stories with our data. Now, the interesting thing is if you look at stories and statistics head to head, uh, you might be surprised that stories actually beat statistics. And there's a great quote here from a famous screenwriting guru, uh, Robert McKee. He's taught a lot of the screenwriters in Hollywood. And he says, storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world today. Well, I'm going to show you two ways that stories beat statistics. And these are both taken from a great book that, I, that was written by Chip and Dan Heath many years ago called Made to Stick. And, you'll, and if you've read that book, you'll be familiar with these two examples. But if not, I highly recommend that book. So the first thing is, is that stories are more memorable than statistics. And Chip Heath, he's actually a professor at Stanford, and he teaches an undergrad communications class. And in that class, he has an exercise that he regularly does where he gives the students uh, different um, data points. And so those students then will take a side on, you know, depending on which side of the issue they want to go on. And they divide up into groups, and they share a short presentation with each other. And they grade each other and they look at, you know, they consider how they've done. And then they think the exercise is over. And about 10 minutes later, uh, the professor Chip Heath comes to them and actually says, okay, how many of you remember any of the stories or sorry, any of the statistics that were shared? Now, a little side note here is that one in 10 of the students will actually incorporate a short anecdote into their presentation. And that's actually what, the students remember. They remember the stories much more than they remember any of the statistics. Only 5% of them remembered any statistics. So stories are built for our human brain in the sense that we think in stories, we process information in stories, and it really resonates with us and sticks with us over time. Okay, so the next thing is that uh, stories are more persuasive than statistics. And so there's another study that's shared in, the, in this book, and it talks about uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, study that was done where they gave students a bunch of tech, uh, they gave them a truck technology survey. And for completing this survey, they got five $1 bills. And that's actually where the experiment begins. After they've taken the survey, they asked them if they'd like to make a small donation to a charity, a real charity called Save the Children. And there are two versions of this brochure. One version has a lot of statistics on the suffering of children in Africa to illness, famine, disease, war. And, you know, lots, hundreds and millions of kids are being affected and, and, and it shares those statistics. And then another version takes a slightly different approach and it shares the experience of Rukia, a seven-year-old girl in Mali and the struggles of her family. And so then what they wanted to look at is how, how which version was more effective. And what they found is that the version that, that talked, you know, shared the story of Rukia more than doubled the amount of on average, the amount of donations that were made um, to the cause. And so for these two reasons, we really want to leverage stories as much as possible in our communications. Now, being a former analyst, I've always kind of struggled with, with um, you know, presenting information, but I always felt strongly that, that logic, you know, if I came with a well-reasoned argument with the data and it was rational, uh, I could convince any decision maker to make the right decision. Well, you know, as I've gotten into business and, and found that doesn't always work. And so even though logic, uh, you would think that logic would persuade something or somebody to make a decision, actually emotion has a much bigger play in decision making than we, we even recognize. And so I like to compare this to, um, to Star Trek. So I'm kind of a, a Star Trek geek here. And I really like Spock because he, you know, he brings the data, he's, he does all the analysis, he's, he's the science, chief science officer, and he's not emotional, he's a Vulcan, so basically or half Vulcan. And so he doesn't have emotions, he tries to, his, tries to suppress them. And so it's really just about the data. However, uh, here we have McCoy, who's the chief medical officer, he's a fiery southerner, uh, very impassioned, and, and he's also advising the Captain Kirk, in this case, the decision maker, to make certain decisions. Well, when neuroscientists look at the effect of emotion, actually emotion has a bigger influence on decision making than data does. 
And so what I like to say is we hear statistics, but we feel stories. And actually scientists or neuroscientists have actually gone in and they've scanned the brain that when we hear data and facts, a couple of areas of our brain light up and they're just associated with processing language. However, when you share a story, then what they've seen is that other areas of the brain will light up where you actually feel what the storyteller is sharing with you. And, and in some cases, you could even have a, a neural coupling between the audience and the, uh, the storyteller where when you look at the, when you scan the, the brain, you know, scan how the, the different waves of the brain are performing, you'll see that they have, they follow a very similar pattern. So there's this coupling that occurs between the audience and the, and the um, storyteller. And another thing to consider here is that when we come with facts and information, a lot of the times with our audiences, they're going to be skeptical. The shields will come up. They're going to be critical. They're going to be skeptical. They're going to nitpick on the details. However, when we come with a story, what we've actually seen is, or what neuroscientists have actually seen is that the shield comes down and people are less likely to nitpick on the details and they're more likely to, they want to see where the story goes. And so this is a very powerful way of communicating information. And, and even people can enter into almost what they call a narrative uh, transportation, where it's kind of like a trance, like an experience. And so this is a really big opportunity for us to communicate our insights and our ideas and basically bridge, take that logic and facts that we have and bridge it to the emotional side of the brain through a story. And so this is what's going to make our insights and, and information that we have and, and with, that we want to share with an audience more palatable, more engaging. It's going to resonate. It's going to be persuasive and memorable. So that's some, those, those are all qualities that we want to have with our, our data communications. Okay, so let's get into the what of data storytelling, and I'll give you a brief kind of summary. Now, no surprise here, there are three key elements to data storytelling. There's data, narrative, and visuals. And what I'd like to do, kind of show the power of data storytelling, is to look at the intersections between these bubbles. So the, the reason why we don't just dump a bunch of raw data on somebody's lap is because we really want to explain the information. So we need a narrative to kind of give context and, and really help guide the audience through the numbers and what they need. Make sure that they're clear and understandable. Uh, the next thing is, why do we use visuals? Well, a lot of the times when we look at raw data, that's in tabular format, it's hard to see anomalies or patterns or trends. And so it's only through the help of visuals that we're able to really enlighten the audience to new things and new insights in the, in the, in the, um, the data that they would miss without the help of visualizations. And then the last area here is, as human beings, we love a good story, especially visual stories. And so that's why we're up late at night watching Netflix until late in the morning because they engage us as human beings, that combination of narrative and visuals. And so if we can take the right data, combine it with the right narrative and the right visuals, we have something that's really powerful that can influence change, uh, change behaviors, change attitudes, beliefs. Um, this is very potent, powerful stuff if we can do it the right way. All right, so now let's get to the how. And I'm gonna focus on two of the pillars, two of the three. I'm gonna focus first on narrative because I think a lot of Data people uh, struggle with the narrative aspect, which is really the structure of your data story. Now, before I get into uh, the structure, I wanna talk about one key constituent, and that's your audience. And so if you think of the story of Robin Hood, all the different ways that it's been told, it's been told for different audiences, right? And so with our data, we need to make sure we understand who is the right audience for my data story, and how do I need to adjust my data story to my audience? Now let's pretend that I'm planning a birthday party for six-year-olds. I'm probably not gonna choose any of the movies, the four on the right. You know, I'd probably go with the Disney, the Disney version because that's gonna appeal to six-year-olds. You know, I'd probably get in trouble if I showed them the Russell Crowe version uh, from the parents. So again, it's really important that we, we make sure uh, that our stories are targeted to a specific audience and that we tailor it to that audience. Okay, so you may have heard, um, you know, if you've heard about stories and, and that they all have a beginning, middle, and end. And, and I had heard that when I first got into data storytelling, but it really didn't help me a whole lot. Um, it actually comes from Aristotle more than 2,000 years ago. 
but you know, uh, a report can have a beginning, middle, and end, and it's not a story. Um, you know, a textbook can have a beginning, middle, and end, and that's not a story. So I kept looking to try and find what I felt would be a better um, model to really build data storytelling on. I'm just going to take a sip of water here. And I came up with the data, the data storytelling arc. <coughs> and it's based on some work that was done by Gustav Freytag, who's a German playwright, who back in the 1800s looked at uh, Shakespearean plays, he looked at Greek tragedies, and he found that they all had a similar arc, a story arc. And I've taken that arc and applied it to data storytelling. So the first stage here is we have a setting and hook, and that's really where we provide context. And we have something that catches the attention or the, of the audience. So it could be a particular metric is, is going up quickly or de decreasing quickly. And that serves as the hook that's gonna get our audience interested in our data story. We also may consider the characters, whether if we're analyzing employee data or marketing data, could be customers, it could be employees, could be partners. Uh, really depends on uh, what the data is about, but we have we can have characters as well in our data story. Then what we do is we have rising insights, and so in a typical action flick, you're going to have the rising action. In this case, we have rising insights that reveal insights into the data, which build up to what I call the aha moment, which is the climax of your data story. It's the major finding, the central insight that you want your uh, audience to understand. If they don't understand anything else from your data story, you want them to, to walk away with this one insight. And then we're not done, because you know this presentation is about driving action. <coughs> and so to share an insight is one thing, but then the audience may have questions. Well, how do, we, how do we take advantage of this opportunity if it's an opportunity, or how do we address this problem? And so what we need to do is go through a potential solution or recommendations on how to fix or address the problem or seize the opportunity. And so through this process, our, hopefully our audience uh, knowledge into the, into the problem or the opportunity is, is enriched and that their likelihood to act on this will be increased as they understand uh, what's in front of them. So I'm gonna give you a, a little example here. It's kind of an e-commerce example here. Um, not going to worry so much about the charts because it's really about the structure that I want you to focus on. So here we have, we're showing that the blue line indicates our sales for the, the year so far and the gray dotted line in the background is typically how we trended over the same period. And we can see here that we've outperformed each quarter until recently in this quarter where something's happened. Our, our revenue has gone down instead of uh, been a, a above where we were last year. So that's our hook and we start to dive into the problem, start to look at what's going on here. So we're first, we're looking at different product categories and all of the blue product cat categories are outperforming where we were last year. Whereas the three orange product categories here are underperforming um, our performance last year. So we've already started to find a problem. And then when we did a scatter plot of the different products within these categories here, we found that the orange ones were all from a particular brand. And so we've got a problem with this brand and something's changed. Maybe we uh, were out of stock of this brand in this quarter. Maybe we changed how we market or the offers that we have, or maybe we took down a, a microsite that focused on this brand. Something happened. And the key thing here is, is that if we don't fix this problem, the aha moment is that we're going to miss our target for this quarter. We're gonna miss it by 38%, which means that none of us will get our bonus for this quarter, which you know, right before Christmas, that could be a real bummer. So now I've got the audience's attention and now I kind of finalize this data story by talking about, well, what are the options? You know, have we done any analysis of what we can do to, fix, to address this problem? And so we've got A, B, and C here, and A is gonna generate the most revenue for the least amount of cost. So that's what we're recommending to the audience. So what I've taken you through <coughs> is a short data storytelling uh, example here of how you could take some findings and then turn it into a data story. So the next thing I wanna go into is the visuals. And these are the scenes of your data story. So let's pretend that you've already structured out, you've gone through your findings, you've chosen some really 
good um, insights and, and observations, and you've basically got a rough um, outline of how you want to present your information. And now I'm going to give you five steps for better visual storytelling. So the first one is to identify the right data. Now, when I first started talking about this topic, it was kind of, I, I felt like maybe this was kind of obvious that you have the right data, but let me walk through what I mean by this. So as we're doing our analysis, in this case here, uh, we might be looking at revenue and customers, and they're both growing into the right. And so this can be, you know, this is a good story where, you know, things are increasing, but what we're trying to say is that our revenue is not increasing at the same rate as our customer base. And so this, this could be a potential problem, but I'm not really visualizing this information in the best possible way. So what I might want to do in this case, I might want to create a calculated metric to show how much revenue per customer is actually decreasing over this time period. And so what I may need to do is step back from my analysis and say, okay, I'm now transitioning from exploring the data where I may have used different visuals to find an insight. And now how do I communicate that effectively? And so sometimes that might mean that I need to create a ratio or a calculated metric or a show the variance or, or different things to really emphasize the information. The other thing I might want to also provide is context, right? So if people are like, okay, well, that's great. You know, the, the revenue per customer has gone down, but how's that compared to the previous year? Well, in this case here, we can see, oh, actually it was much higher the previous year. And so again, having the right data can really help our story in this case with context. I'll give you one more example here. It's a slightly different uh, data set this time where you have safety incidents by plant. Now I can easily compare what's happening in the two years here and see which one, you know, which plants are having more uh, incidents than they were previously. But maybe what I want to do is show the variance, the year to year variance. And so the orange ones, the ones that are positive, they actually are, you know, having an increase in the number of safety incidents. And that's not a good thing. Whereas plant three and four, they have actually gone down in the number of incidents that they're having. And that's a positive thing. And so by quickly doing the math for the audience, you know, where they don't have to compare, you know, or do observations, just looking at the heights or doing the math in their head, we can do that for them. And that can lead to a better data storytelling. Okay, the next step is to choose the right visualizations. And so there was actually a study done uh, back in the mid 80s where they looked at how effective different visualizations are for sharing or, or facilitating comparisons. And so some were very accurate. So position along a common scale or position along an unaligned scale, these are very easy for us as human beings to really look at, uh, look at a chart and make very uh, clear, accurate comparisons. And as we move from left to right, it gets harder and harder to really make accurate comparisons. We can make more gener general or generic comparisons. And, and typically we'll see uh, shading and color saturation on a, on a map, for example. Uh, but really we start to see, okay, some of these are more challenging. And so we've often heard that pie charts, you know, some people have called pie charts evil. Uh, obviously they have some issues because they're a combination of the angle and area. And that makes them kind of in the middle here and harder to, for us to kind of draw a comparison. So let me give you an example here. Here's a chart showing traffic to our website from different social media uh, sources. And, you know, my question would be, well, you know, is it Facebook or Twitter or YouTube that's really the bigger driver? And so what do we have to do with pie charts? We have to label them um, to really show the values that, um, that they have. And, and that's problematic when you have to always label a chart because it doesn't communicate on its own. Whereas if we look at bar charts here, in this case here, I can see clearly that Twitter has more traffic coming to us than, than Facebook or YouTube. And I can still label these, but again, the visual is actually communicating information in a very efficient way. And so we have to think about the visuals that we're using and how can we make sure that our message is getting across. And again, we're not making it, our audience work extra hard to see the insight that we already see ourselves. Uh, the next thing is we want to calibrate our visuals to our message. And so sometimes we ch we've chosen the right visual, but maybe we haven't oriented it to our audience so they can clearly see the insights that we want to share with them. 
And so in this case here, we have um, different products and we've done some analysis of the number of orders across three different customer segments, new customers, return customers, and premium customers. Now, if I'm going to present this to a bunch of product managers, it's gonna be harder for them to make comparisons across these different segments. And so what we may wanna do instead is we may wanna pivot the data and really break it down by each product. So each product manager can go in and do much more easier comparisons across their different uh, segments. And so this is really about facilitating comparisons and making sure that it's easy for our audience to do, to see the insights that they need to see. Another example here might be where, you know, we're looking at products across different regions. And it's easy here to see which region has the most sales. Uh, however, if we wanted to look at say product B, then the challenge with this visualization with the stack bar chart is we don't have a common baseline. And so it's very hard for us to make those comparisons. So what we might want to do is pivot to a panel bar chart. Uh, we might want to label it. And, and then it's easy because they have each of those products have their own baseline. It's easy for people to see um, and make comparisons and really uh, interpret the data for themselves. The next thing we want to do is remove unnecessary noise. And so a lot of times when we, again, going back to that exploratory uh, analysis that we're doing, uh, you know, we're trying to find the signal and there's a lot of noise and, and it's hard work to really find uh, the signal in the data and, and that will inform our, our data uh, stories. Now, one of the mistakes that we can make, and as we find that signal, sometimes when we go to communicate it, we can leave in some of that noise or we can actually add our own noise through just not, not communicating our information effectively. So one way, there's several different techniques that we can use. I'm gonna share three here. But one thing we can do is we can step back from our data and say, okay, what's really important for our message? Do we need to include all of the data that we've analyzed? Or can we strip back some of that information? And so in some cases we may wanna remove, you know, in this case here, we've got four articles instead of uh, 10 articles, because you know, it just gets kind of noisy when we do it that way. So we still got some context. Uh, but we've kind of lightened the burden in terms of the audience interpreting the data. And we still highlight the, the article A there in blue that we want people to look at. Another thing we can do is sometimes not all the information is, is necessary. And so we can aggregate some of these lower values that just get in the way of our message. And so we can combine them into other countries and it doesn't get in the way of what we're communicating on some of these bigger countries. And then going back to another spaghetti chart here, another thing we can do is we can separate out the different data series into their own kind of panel uh, line charts here. So we can see them, we can make comparisons side by side, but the data is not you know, overlapping and creating some noise for each other. And it makes it easier for the audience to kind of see and compare the numbers. So that's three ways um, that you can kind of remove some of the noise that can get in the way of your message. So the next thing we want to do is we've got five steps here. We're on the last one here, focusing attention on what's important. And so one of the things we can do, going back to that uh, spaghetti chart that we had, you know, we can use color and grayscale. And so you're, you're like the director of your own data story in the sense that color, you can pull to the foreground a key point that you want to emphasize to the audience and then push everything else for context um, and, and use grayscale to kind of put it in, in the background. So color is one of the most important and powerful tools that you have in your, your toolbox for data storytelling. Another thing you can do is focus your, your audience using text. And so in this case here, I'm looking at, you know, as we go through that exploratory side, we're, we're putting kind of descriptive names on our, on our charts. But when we transition to the explanatory side, we may want to revisit some of those chart names. And so in this case here, we have average time spent by country. It's accurate, but is it, a, is it really explaining the data? Well, what we can do is, you know, the main point we're trying to make here is that the US users spend more time in the app. So well, let's make that the title of our chart and really focus it. Obviously I'm using color as well to really focus on, on that, that green here. Um, but the title and the color can work together to steer the attention, to focus the attention of the audience and really add to that narrative that we're trying to build. Finally, another thing that we can do sometimes when we have a lot of data, 
you know, and, 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 and a chart can be really hard to follow. And so what we can do is we can actually break it up. And what I mean by that, using animations or multiple charts, we can, in this case here, we say, okay, uh, let's talk about the form start rate. That's the top of the funnel. That's when somebody gets to the page to start a funnel or st sorry, start filling out an online form. And so we can make sure that the audience understands that. Then we can go to the next metric when they submit that form, and then we capture that form complete. Any questions? So we following along. Okay, great. Now we get to actually converting that lead into an actual sale. And how often do we um, convert that into a lead? or an actual or an opportunity or whatever we're looking at here. And so the other thing we might bring in is that there is some kind of problem here. And so then we kind of, after everybody kind of understands the chart, we introduce the annotation or where we want to focus their attention. And so by breaking up the content into manageable chunks, we're able to communicate our insights and, and tell our story more clearly to our audience. Well, what I wanna do is leave you with one last data story. And when I present in, in person with people, um, you know, we, I often ask how many of you have actually had surgery? And, and I feel fortunate that I haven't had surgery, um, at least major surgery before. But I definitely know if, if I had a surgeon operating on me, I'd want him to, or her to wash their hands. And back in the 1800s, they didn't know about the importance of washing hands. In fact, you know, at that time, they didn't know about germ theory. And Ignis Simmelweis, he was actually um, a doctor and he was an administrator over a, a university hospital and a professor at this, at this university. And he noticed he inherited a really bad situation. Um, this, this clinic, that, they had two clinics, one that taught doctors and one that taught midwives. And they had a real issue with childbed fever, which was a disease or an illness that was going right through around the world. And a lot of women would get, um, when they delivered their babies, they'd get sick and die shortly thereafter. And it had a very high mortality rate. And one of the things that they noticed is that the doctor's clinic actually had a much higher average mortality rate than the midwives did. And they, they had no idea what was causing this. And so they looked at different things, like maybe it was bad air, you know, at the time they didn't know about germs. So they thought, well, maybe it's bad air that the doctor's clinic has, or maybe it's the, the temperature in that room. Maybe it's, maybe we put too many women into that clinic, you know, so maybe it's the, um, how, how um, overcrowded it is. They really had no idea what was causing this until one day when uh, a doctor was actually working with some student doctors and they were performing an autopsy on one of these women that had died of childbed fever. And as he was performing this autopsy, one of the student doctors accidentally cut this, this doctor's um, hand. And then sure enough, it got infected and he died. And Ignis Simmelweis, uh, he was a good friend of Ig Ignis's. Um, and so Ignis was actually on vacation, had to come back. And he had the tough job of performing the autopsy on this doctor. And the interesting thing that when he performed the autopsy, he's like, wait a second, a lot of this, the uh, pathology of how this doctor died was very similar to how these women were dying. And then he started to, it dawned on him, hey, wait a second. So one of the common policies that they had at this hospital, many other hospitals around the world, was to have the student doctors perform autopsies in the morning and then go about their, their rounds doing examinations and delivering babies the rest of the day. And so... He had dawned on him, maybe we're not, maybe we're, we're passing along uh, maybe some particles from these cadavers that could be uh, making these women sick. And so he introduced a new policy where at the time when they had the, uh, when he introduced this policy, he introduced a hand washing policy. And at the time, the, the mortality rate was 12.2% in clinic one. And they got a chlorine lime solution and they made the doctors uh, wash their hands in this after they performed these autopsies. And immediately in the next month, it, the, the de death rate went down 82%. And then over time, it was slowly coming back up. And that's when Ignis noticed that some of the student doctors weren't really adhering to the strict um, policies that he had around washing hands. So he clamped down on them and really enforced the policies. And then over the next several, um, months, they had a really great 
uh, low rate of mortality uh, death in, in that clinic. In fact, for two months, they actually had zero people dying, which was unheard of. And you'll notice, though, at the end that it, it went back up to 4.9%. So you may be wondering, what's going on? Why would Ignis let that happen? Well, Ignis was dismissed. Um, he was dismissed by his supervisor who did not feel that doctors were contributing to the death of these women, that, that washing their hands was really not that important and wasn't um, something that they needed to do. And, and basically his reputation in uh, Vienna at the time was, was tarnished and he had to return to Budapest and try and eke out, a, uh, get another position at a, at a local hospital. And for the next 10 years, he kept waiting for this, for people to, to embrace his practices. And eventually he published um, a journal article talking and sharing a lot of data and information on what happened, um, but wasn't able to convince anybody to adhere to his policies. So why wasn't he successful? Well, one thing, the accurate data. So yes, he didn't have, he didn't know the cause of, of, uh, of why his hand washing policy worked, but he had 18 months of data showing that it did work and that, you know, he had the data to back him up. Uh, was this valuable information? Absolutely. If women uh, were, could have been, thousands of women's lives could have been saved by doctors simply washing their hands. And so this is incredibly valuable and super actionable as well, because all that was required were that, that the doctors would wash their hands. And yet he wasn't able to convince anybody to embrace his, his ideas. One of the challenges that he had is in his journal article, when he published his journal, he did not visualize his information. It was, I think, over 60 different data tables and none of it visualized. He also didn't tell the story. He wasn't able to convince the other doctors. And he actually started calling them ignoramuses and murderers, which isn't going to endear yourself to any audience. So, we need to learn from this mistake and make sure that our insights, that we can be data storytellers. And I like this quote from Stephen Few here. He talked about the numbers have an important story to tell. They rely on you to give them a clear and convincing voice. So like Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. But I, I would also add also great opportunity. You know, as we have these insights, as we discover um, powerful insights, if we can communicate them in an effective manner, then we can drive the action and value that those insights could, can, can uh, provide. And you know, the potential that we see in those insights can actually be actualized or realized by our audience when we effectively tell our data stories. So if you'd like to learn more about effective data storytelling, I invite you to uh, go to my website, effectivedatastorytelling.com. You can download the the uh, first chapter for free and uh, look forward to your questions that you have. All right, thank you very much, Brent. And I know that um, you know, one of the reasons why, why data storytelling is so important is the, uh, is the fact that you can't really, you can't communicate the findings effectively um, until you can present that story. Right. So a lot of the other uh, topics that we're talking about at Cloud Data Summit are, you know, about they're about infrastructure, they're about, uh, you know, it's about server planning and all of these things, you know, and, and a lot of those things are not tremendously valuable if you can't take the output of those and then communicate those with the stakeholders, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's kind of that last mile of analytics. I kind of see it, you know, obviously you make a big investments in, in, cloud data and, and, you know, obviously storing that data, processing that data, um, you know, and, and sharing it, visualizing it through reports and dashboards. But when we have these insights that we need to share with, with decision makers, we need to make sure that they're communicated clearly and that they can understand them. Um, too many times, you know, just like, you know, when the example that I gave at the beginning of my presentation, you know, we make mistakes, we don't present the information, we don't communicate it in a way um, that our audience is going to receive it. And so I think by combining the data with a, a narrative and obviously having the visuals there as well to kind of communicate that information, we're going to put our insights in a better uh, situation to be understood and also acted on. Yeah, I completely agree. 
uh, we do have some questions rolling in. So first question that we have says, can you give us some examples of what surplus data could be removed? Yeah, so you know, as we go through the exploratory side of, of looking at, at uh, our data, sometimes you know, we're gonna have, maybe we have 100 different products or product categories that we've analyzed and then we found that there's three or four that are really you know, driving our insight. Now, do we have to keep all 100 products or categories? That's a question. I, mean, I don't think we need to. I mean, there's a couple of avenues you can go there. And I shared you know, where you actually strip out information that's redundant, you know, if it's not really showing anything net new compared to where you're focusing the attention of your audience, then you can strip it away. Just keep some there that, that shows the trends of these other products, but uh, so you have some context, but you, do you need to have it all? The other thing, the other alternative would be, you know, obviously using color to, to highlight the, the, the categories that you want people to focus on and then use grayscale to push back the hundred, you know, categories, you know, or products to the background. But, but the key thing is sometimes when we're doing analysis, we'll, we, we want to we analyze the full data set and, and so we have all the values and then we make the mistake of dragging that over to when we're communicating and, and, and then it becomes noise, you know, it's almost can get in the way of our data story. So you don't want to strip out too much information that it removes your context. Uh, but you also, you know, you need to step back from your presentation or step back from your analysis and say, okay, what is still critical to communicating this information? You may find a lot of that information is redundant or repetitive and, or maybe it's just too much, it's not relevant. Maybe it could be from a time series perspective where, you know, do I need to show three years worth of data? You know, maybe, maybe I don't, I just need to show this year's results compared to last year's results and that's it. I don't need to show the past 15 years unless it's part of your story. Um, so it's really about understanding what your key points are and then looking at your data and saying, what contributes to the story or what supports the narrative and what is just noise it's going to get in the way it's not necessary it doesn't you know does it add to the story or if i took it out does it actually by removing it add to the story because it's no longer there uh and there's another question here that actually ties into what you're just referring to it says how would you recommend highlighting certain dimensions with color yeah, so obviously a couple of thoughts there. So as you go through, you want to make sure that you're not using all the colors in the rainbow, right? You want to make sure, as I shared in the example, whenever you can use grayscale um, in addition to one or two bold colors, I would say you don't want to go to, you know, using too many different colors and you want to be consistent on those colors. So if you were using a particular color for say a uh, particular brand you want to use the same color each time you mention that brand so that the audience is going to say oh okay blue google is always blue in your charts so when i look at your charts and i see a blue that means it's google um, and so you want to be consistent with your colors you want to refrain from using too many colors and, and sometimes a, a monochromatic kind of approach can be helpful where you're not again uh, overloading people with with too many colors but also, uh, the shades need to be distinct so you can kind of make the differences. But, but you know, you want to be careful with color. Color is, you got to use it strategically. If, if you have a lot of colors going on in your charts and you haven't really put a lot of thought into it, um, you're wasting the color. Color is, is one of your most powerful tools that you have in your tool belt uh, for telling data stories. And so you want to be careful how you use it and make sure that it's, um, it's used selectively and strategically. Excellent. And um, next question. How do you get buy-in from stakeholders who don't see the value in data storytelling? Yeah, well, I think one of the things I think we have to realize is that for a long time now, um, you know, the way that data and information has been shared is through reports and, and data dumps and and uh, very complicated dashboards. And so uh, a data story is kind of a new thing. It's a new approach. And so it's gonna take some time to kind of convince people um, that they wanna hear things in the format of a data story. Uh, one of the coping mechanisms that I think executives have 
is that they want the executive summary, right? They want to just give me the, give me the data, give it to me quick, give it to me fast. And, and that actually breaks the model of a story because you, in the story, you're building up to your, your aha moment, your, your big climax. So there's actually a strategy that I, I've had people after a presentation say, oh, you know, we love data storytelling, uh, but I don't know, I'm not sure if I can do that for uh, my executives because they're kind of conditioned to kind of want um, the information quickly and upfront. And, and so what I've, what I've done, if we, if we go back to the, the example um, that I used there with the structure, I, I basically say, okay, there's, you can take from your data story, the hook, uh, take the hook, so that's, that kind of sets some context for, for the, uh, what you're going to share with them. And then you take your aha moment and share that as a package. And I call that a data, data trailer. So it's kind of like a movie trailer in the sense it's the worst movie, movie trail ever because it actually gives away the plot of the, of the story. Um, and the reason why you do that approach is so that you can seek permission to tell the full data story where you actually have... Uh, you know, the full setting and the, the rising insights and the, and the resolution and next steps. Um, but you basically gain their permission to tell them a data story by using a data trailer. So that's that combination of the hook and the aha moment. And, and then at that point, they might say, hmm, yeah, that's interesting, but I'm, you know, it's not really what I'm, I don't, I don't need to learn more. So in that case, you're not wasting their time and, and you're not wasting your time either. In other cases, it might be like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Tell me more about that. And then that's where you can revert back to telling a data story. So I think over time, I think as human beings, even executives are human beings and we consume stories in, in every facet of our lives. So, you know, from the, the podcast that we listen to on the way to work, they, um, or actually we don't really go to work anymore. <laughs> At home, we listen to. Um, it could be, you know, in the, in the Netflix shows that we watch and, and the movies that we watch and the books that we read, um, we as human beings like stories. And I believe the executives are similar in that, that sense. It just may be where we need to condition them to, to share with them how a data story can be a much more pleasurable and engaging, uh, memorable, and persuasive experience for them, which hopefully will then drive action. And, and so I think uh, over time, we can gain buy-in and, and really help them to see the value of data stories. Excellent. So, kind of the uh, the uh, summary to that is to give the uh, give the stakeholders a little bit of a teaser to show what you can do and maybe keep trying at that until uh, until you get a bite, right? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, you get a bite, and then you can expose them to a, a full data story, and then who knows? You know, they might actually prefer that format and that structure going forward. Excellent. Uh, last question that we have here is, uh, what are some of the best resources for learning data visualization that you can recommend? Yeah, if you're looking for data visualization, there's a number of books out there. Uh, obviously, Stephen Few, Edward Tufte, um, there's Cole Neshbaumer, Catholic book uh, on data, store or data visualization. And uh, also Alberto Cairo is also another good resource. Um, so there's lots of good resources out there. And, um, you know, if you want to get up to speed on data visualization, if you're interested in data storytelling, then definitely check out my book. Um, and you can go to the website, effectivedatastorytelling.com to download the first chapter if you're curious for free. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Brent. We are out of time right now. Uh, if anybody would like to ask any more questions, feel free to drop those in chat or to, to uh, join Brent in the uh, Q&A session. Thank you very much, Brent, and uh, we'll see you over there. Thanks, Eric.